The good news is it's everybody's birthright to be loved unconditionally and to give love unconditionally. And we're going to figure out how we do that. And I want to set up the, my intention for being here. So first of all, to really inject some energy uh, in this new location with some of our fr friends, some are new, some are, are uh, that we know for a longer time. And also, the reason I'm here tonight is to listen to Malika. Yeah. Um, I'll interject maybe a little bit here and there if I, if I think it's appropriate. But one thing I can say, you know, I was, I was speaking to Malika about her master class that we just saw the, the uh, trailer for. I can guarantee you that if you have at least an opening of, a, of your heart and desire, you will leave here tonight with a few more tools, a little bit of consciousness about how either to improve a relationship that you're in or to achieve and find the relationship you want. One of the things that Monica mentions even in the trailer that every single one of us is meant to have the most soulmate, powerful relationship that, as I think Monica will speak about a little bit later, continues to grow in the joy and fulfillment that it gives us. So for me here tonight, my desire as I walk out these doors at later is that my relationship becomes even better. And I ask all of us to open your mind and your heart and your desire with that intention, that everything you hear, there'll be some interactivity, all of that is to either help improve, make even more powerful the relationships you currently have, or maybe give us the tools and the ability to find and create the most important relationship that we will ever have in our life. And with that, I'll sit a little further back and <laughs> So I echo Michael's sentiments. We're so excited to be here. Um, new space, new energy, open minds. I really want you to rethink everything tonight. I know it sounds like, oh, I rethought this, or I, I rethought that, what I had for lunch, what I'm gonna do tomorrow, but rethinking is really setting a new intention for yourself and understanding that what you may think you know is based on a lot of other things. So we're going to reset tonight. I have been to over 500 weddings and counting. I have counseled over a thousand couples and we've done a lot of work in our 26 years of marriage. And so I guess at this point, I'm an expert in relationships and I really want more than anything for all of you to leave here tonight with a new understanding of what relationships should look like, what unconditional love really is and where you are at with the relationship with yourself. There's a lot of relationship advice out there. Mostly, it's a lot of relationship advice that will make you very unhappy. There are a lot of misconceptions, there are a lot of isms, who should pay for the first date, who should call the person first, all these kinds of rules, texting, etc. Love is never about that. It's never about those kinds of checkpoints. If you have that focus, it's going to lead you to a place where you're focused on the wrong things. So I want you tonight, throw all of that out the door. The good news is it's everybody's birthright to be loved unconditionally and to give love unconditionally. And we're going to figure out how we do that. So I'm going to tell you something that may shock you. There's no such thing as a stable relationship. Is that a surprise to anybody? There can be happy relationships, but not stable ones. Change is the law of life. People crave change, they color their hair, they move to a different place. But the kind of change I'm talking about is the kind that's uncomfortable. It's the kind that we really don't want. But you have to look first with any relationship that we're going to talk about tonight, your relationship with change. Change is there for the ride. The only free will we have in that is do you choose the change or do you allow life to change you? There's always before and after. If you think in this moment about a time in your life where you were one way and then something happened, usually it's something painful, and you were different after that. That's how change occurs. Well, let me start with this. Out of all the tragedies in life, the way that, to my thinking as I see it, it's not so much 
divorce or illness or death. It's the loss of dreams, right? I think we all, when we're younger, we look at relationships and we dream about who we're going to find and how we're going to feel when we're that person and what our life will look like. And then when we're in a relationship and it's not going that way, suddenly, well, this is not what I expected. This is not what I anticipated. This is not the life I thought I would have. But you can spend that lifetime in that space of this is not what I thought it would be, or you can direct the change that you want. We put so much energy in creating businesses, even our spiritual pursuits, our bodies, our looks, so many, so much energy in all these places, but we never really look at our relationships like that, that they are meant to be looked at and understood that they will change from how you enter it at the beginning to how you evolve with the person or you grow, hopefully, it's meant to be an evolution of change. The strongest relationships are when two people are committed to changing together. I was interviewing Maria Menunez. We, I was actually on her podcast and we were talking about this idea of change. And she said, Monica, I actually have a picture of the before and after. She was leaving E! Entertainment and she was excited because it was a a more lucrative position. She was excited for this new change and she's wearing her favorite outfit. It was like a bright pink suit and she has a look on her face. She's happy. The next day she finds out that her mother has stage four brain cancer and her mother died shortly after that. And then Maria, a few years later, ended up having a benign brain tumor as well. And she said, Monica, I look at that picture. The very next day I looked at that picture of me and I was not the same person. She was changed. But then she decided in which way she wanted that change to go. And that's the power that you have tonight. You have to understand whether you're single or you're in a relationship, you will change, your partner will change. And the only way that you can ensure that you will be happy in the relationship is if you are committed to changing and growing together, that you hold each other accountable for that change. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of a couple and they say, Monica, I don't know what happened. This is not who I married. I don't know what happened. They're changing. This is not what I thought they would be. Well, duh, of course they're going to change. We're going to change every moment of our lives. So I want you, the first rethink moment, I want you to think about how you are changing and what that change should look like. Now, the hot question that everybody asks is, how will I find my soulmate? Or what does a soulmate relationship look like? Or how do I know I'm with my soulmate? It's such a buzz word. You're not going to like this answer probably at first, but this is the truth. A soulmate relationship is not what you think it is. It's not euphoria and now you feel whole. What's the line in Jerry Maguire? He, you complete, oh, me. You there complete you go. me. There you go. <laughs> he loves me just for who I am. The, the, happily ever after cherished delusions, end of story kind of thing that we see in movies. By the way, the movies end where relationships really begin. The movie ends, they walk off into the sunset and they live happily ever after. And then what happens? Your relationship starts. They don't show you that part of the movie, right? This soulmate secret is, the soulmate relationship is when you find somebody who opposes you. What? Opposition? Nobody likes opposition, right? Opposition is you're looking in the mirror. If you stand in front of a mirror and you see your reflection, it's you're opposing it, right? Opposition is there to help you grow, to see the parts of yourself that don't serve you, to have somebody be honest and also be supportive. It's all of those things, but that means it's also hard work. There was somebody I worked with a couple, Ethan, and by the way, he's in my book, Rethink Love, and all of the men, when they first read that chapter, were like, I love Ethan, I wanna be Ethan. I'm like, okay, well, you're missing completely the point of the story. So Ethan married a woman who was everything he wanted. She was a stay-at-home mom, four children. When he came home from work, she greeted him at the door. I'm not making this up, by the way. She took his briefcase and she handed him a Highland Park neat. And then she walked him up to the bathroom where the bathtub was already drawn. And she rubbed his back with a washcloth while he told her about his day. I could see the men and the women's faces. It's brilliant. <laughs> and she was listening and she was attentive. And all the children had done their homework, had been bathed, and they were waiting for him to come down so they could all eat dinner together. This is what Ethan wanted. 
But guess what happened? He was bored. Guess what happened? He was not very happy in the situation. And he started to look elsewhere. He wanted somebody who would challenge him, who would oppose him, who would make him be curious about things he never thought of. He wanted to have those conversations. The hard part of this was, and he made the difficult decision to leave the relationship and leave the family, because he had set this up. He had found a woman and told her exactly what he wanted her to be, and she was that, and he was dissatisfied. This couple could have used more discomfort in the relationship. I always say, would you rather the pain of regret or the pain of discomfort? It's okay to be uncomfortable. In fact, we all, all of us in this room, have been in moments in life where we're uncomfortable, where we've been through pain, where we've been through challenges. I am just suggesting that you seek out the discomfort, that you step ahead of it and you look for the change. If you're in a relationship or look at past relationships, where do you think your partner might want to change or grow? Maybe you've ignored it because it would be uncomfortable for you if they changed it that way. I know another couple, they were both overweight, one lost a lot of weight, was on a health kick, and the other one kept sabotaging him because she wasn't ready to make that change. We do all kinds of things because we are afraid of change, full stop. But if you understand that change is necessary and inevitable, that opposition actually is going to be your greatest motivator for change and growth, you might rethink how you have your relationships today. I'll give you one more example. There's a great movie. It's a true story of two race car drivers. And Ron Howard created a movie in 2013 called Rush. And it was James Hunt, a race car driver, and Nikki Lade. Have, who's seen that movie? Such a great, I highly recommend it. So they were competing against each other. They thought they were each other's enemies. And they rode, you know, they raced each other very aggressively. And one day, Nicky Lade, his car explodes. He's severely burned all over his body. And he's in the hospital for a very long period of time. And while he's in the hospital, he's watching James Hunt win race after race after race. And he's screaming at the TV, cursing him out, right? He's so angry and he's feeling horrible and so much pain. His lungs are being pumped and vacuumed. And his doctor walks in one day and he said, stop seeing that you have been given an enemy as such a curse in your life. A wise man gets more from their enemy than a fool does from their friend. And then what happened, he came out of the hospital and he was now more motivated to get back in the race car than ever. And then he had a conversation with James Hunt and he said, you know, I feel so responsible for what happened to you because they were racing and they were very aggressive and he felt responsible and he stopped him while he was mid-sentence and he said, you are responsible, but you're responsible for getting me out of that bed and into the race car again. And that's when their friendship started because they stopped seeing opposition as something that was bad for them. But in fact, it was something that was part of their greatest growth and their greatest good. So just think for a moment, what in your life, where, who, do you feel there's opposition? Are you making it about the person? Or you can you kind of shift and rethink it to say, okay, this opposition that I experience is there for my growth and for my evolution. Just take a moment and think about that. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying listening to you. No, I was just gonna well, what I what I was gonna what I was actually gonna ask you is is in, in I'm sure in this room there's people who are in a relationship or already married and couples. How do how does a couple that it, because part of the problem is that things aren't a problem until they become one, right? And what you're suggesting, which of course we, I completely agree with, is that there has to be this push and pull opposition within a relationship. So how does a couple that's relatively fine create that opposition? Well, I don't think you have to create it. I think that it's always there. The problem is we don't recognize it as opposition. We think you're the problem, right? This thing you're doing, if you could just change, or if you could just see me or hear me, or if it could just be easier, if we could have fun, they focus on the lack instead of seeing what's lack or opposition as an opportunity. Everything that I will ever share in relationships, it's just rethinking, right? If you look at opposition, opportunity. Those words are very similar. It's just how you view things and how you want to see them. Because very often people just see their partner as the issue and they get stuck in that rut. 
But I, I mean, a few nights ago, we were having dinner with one of our friends in New York who's in a, we'll call it a challenging relationship. And I'm trying to think which dinner. It was I'll, Tuesday night. I'll get there. Um, <laughs> and, and it became very clear in our conversation that even though the relationship is still having its challenges, he has completely transformed in the past, we'll call it year and a half, because of the fact that his partner was not was, was being in opposition to him. Now, of course, you don't want to be in a place where there's constant opposition, but you do want to make sure that your relationship is pushing both of you to grow and to change. And what, what you're saying, which I think is a very important understanding, that unless that is happening, it might take a week or month or 10 years, the relationship will, will stop being fulfilling, no matter how great it was in the beginning, unless there is that constant push for, from both partners in the relationship to push the other, to, to assist the other in growing. But here's the thing, right? Everybody needs a mirror. Everybody needs an opposition. Everybody needs somebody to point out the characteristics that don't serve them. But not everybody wants to let go of their story of victimization. Not everybody wants to have those conversations. Not everybody wants to push the ego aside and say, I'm open. And that's the truth. So for all the people that walked in tonight wanting to ask the question, how do I find my soulmate? First thing is, you have to be willing to let go of the victimization. You have to be willing to be open to opposition. And mostly, you have to have a relationship with yourself that can discern what's real and what's not from what you're being opposed about. And I think to add to that, which is what you said before, is that unless you truly have a desire to change on a consistent basis, you're not really ready for your soulmate, even if you're already married to them. That's right, because yeah. you won't experience it as a soulmate relationship. Exactly. You'll hate you'll them. Yeah, you'll have yeah. the things that bother you. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a four-step process on how to get to this place. Because guess what? You need to become the one to recognize the one. Most people think I'm going to recognize the one and they're going to help me become the one, right? You have to be the person. If you have your list, your list of who you want to find, all the characteristics they have, all of that, that long special list that most people create when they're single, you need to be that first. And when you are that, you will recognize that person as your soulmate. And I know this completely because that's exactly what happened with us. We knew each other for years, never ever saw each other as anything other than Michael and Monica. There was zero sparks. And then we did a lot of work individually. And one day we recognized each other and we were married nine months later. Literally, that is how it happened. It's more of a romantic story, but I'm being con aware of time. Okay, so here are the four, the four steps to become the one. First is you want to face your baggage. We are all a sum of our past experiences. We are a mix of how we gave love and how we receive love. We are part of hurt and pain and all of the experiences. And most issues that come up in relationships are not so much that you don't know your partner's story, it's not you're not aware of your own, right? How were we affected from the past? What happened when we were younger? What kind of things did we see that kind of shaped a belief system for us that may or may not be true? So the first thing is to face your baggage. It's a hard thing to do, but it's a necessary thing to do. Because relationships don't fall because, again, you didn't know your partner and you don't know their story. What is yours? How do you feel about it? How have you reconciled it? The second is tap into your authenticity. So if we talk about authenticity, most people think authenticity is honesty, which of course is related, but authenticity is really about being genuine and therefore worthy of belonging. And that part is key, acceptance, belonging. Most people think I will be worthy of love when I am thin enough, smart enough, wealthy enough, successful enough, fill in the blanks. And if you wait for that day, it's never going to come because we are a work in pro progress and process and we will never ever arrive to any one thing. We're always changing and evolving. So don't wait till you're perfect because it's never going to happen until you think that you are worthy of love. And remember, you loved yourself when you came into this world, and somewhere along the way, we forget. We lose that love for ourselves, but you can find it again. The third is write your credo. And I, again, when you purchase and check out the masterclass, 
you will find out how to write your credo, but credo is a very, very powerful exercise. It is a, a belief that you have formed, principles, beliefs, that shape how you live your life day to day. Actually, could I get a copy of, um, do I have it here, Breathing Gloves? I want to read my credo. So I formed and wrote my credo when I had my second son, who was born with Down syndrome. And I remember, let me just find this. Was supposed to happen earlier. Where is the credo? Do you find it, Ruth? Um, where I was overwhelmed by many, many emotions that I had. And I didn't know what I believed, and everybody's opinion affected me. And this is how I have formed my own credo. And it became my mantra for years and years. And it's an exercise I really recommend that all of you do when you are home, you take a minute. It's what you know to be true. And it could be funny, it could be serious, but it's a belief that you have formed over your experiences over time. Are you not finding it? I can't find it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I think you have an opportunity to do it on their own, so maybe when they do it. You are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Look at you. You get an A plus, Mr. <laughs> student there. That's great. Okay, so this is my credo. And I had a real hard time accepting his diagnosis at first. So in that process, I discovered that a lot of the, my views and the things that I thought I believed were really not true. And by identifying the falsehoods that I had bought into, I was able to discover my true belief. Okay, so my credo is, in change there is great power. Among the many inf conflicting emotions I felt in those tumultuous days after Josh's birth were a sense of betrayal of my body, distance from my husband, and separation from my first child. The injustice of hearing a list of limitations the doctor said Josh would have, things he would never say, do, or experience, made me feel he had no future at all. I realized I was a person invested in others' opinions of me. I would read people's faces that I passed, staring at me and my newborn, wondering what they saw, wondering if they pitied me, if they could tell he was different. It was an incredibly painful time, but as I've learned since, such, such times contain huge opportunity. Instead of letting this experience define me, I chose change. I chose to embrace my son and discover the beauty of his soul and all he could offer. I chose change. In change, there is great power. I chose to persevere regardless of the present circumstances because I have come to know that strong people are committed to change and growth every day of their lives. They live their lives with values, passions, and dreams, even when others may not acknowledge, affirm, or agree with them. I know that in change there is great power. So it's a powerful thing because most people don't know what they believe. And so then they are susceptible to anybody else's opinions. And then you're influenced by that and the other person. And before you know, you're not even living your own life. To take the time to really stop and say, okay, what is it that I believe means that when you're in a relationship then, you can be authentic. You can be true to yourself. You can be genuine. You can be imperfect. You can be vulnerable and know that you are worthy of love. Know that you can receive love and you can also give it because you understand who you are. You have a love within yourself that you have created over time. And it's never too late to do this. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. None of that matters, but you have to take the time to create that kind of shift and that change. And the fourth step is rethink everything. Our perception is super powerful, but our ability to change our perception is even more powerful. My youngest daughter, Abigail, when she was five years old, we were walking up the steps of our house and we have planters in, by the front door. And we're walking up and she said, oh, mommy, look, they're yellow. And I said, I know, gosh, I have to, they, they're dying. I have to get rid of them. They used to be green. And she said, Mommy, that's a horrible word, dying. They're beautiful. Yellow is my favorite color. She didn't know that that represented that they were, in fact, dying. So you have two people who are observing the same thing, right? We're both observing the plants. 
where we're having two different experiences based on what we understand, based on our past experiences. She's never seen a plant die. It was green, now it's yellow. Wow, that's magic. I understood that now they look ugly because they were supposed to be green. It's just how we view things. So again, we're going to take a time now, and I hope if you have pen or paper and just to do a little workshop, because I think it's important. I want to ask you these questions, and maybe you can share with the person next to you after you take a minute to write it down first. Can I, can I share something before you? Sure. Read? So I just want to say one of the things, as Monica mentioned, because the fourth step, right, is rethink everything, which is so important. One of the, I'll share with you personally, one of the things I'm really working on myself, even though I've been studying this wisdom for uh, over 40 plus years now, is, is something which I hope is not too deep of a concept, but I think if you are able to, to get there, it's not having any expectation of what comes next. So all of us, certainly those of us who've been, who have any type of wisdom, understanding, uh, we have who we are now, our thoughts about the present, and also what we desire the next moment to be, what we desire the next day, the next week, the next month. But in truth, if you're really on the path of change, at the ultimate state, what it means is that you have no expectation of what comes next. All that you know is that it's going to be a higher level for you. And I think if you think about any time you were upset, any time you were disappointed, it simply was because you had a thought, a desire, this is what I want to come next. This is what I want the effect to be. But if you're able to live your life in such a state where you're completely open to any possibility of what comes next, then there will never be a disappointment. There will never be anything that upsets you. So for me, the fourth step, which is rethink everything, is really that, that ability, and it takes time and it takes work, but really to get to that state where you have zero expectation of what comes next. So maybe repeat the four before people can... Before the workshop. Yes. So the first is... Face your baggage, tap into your authenticity, write your credo based on what you know to be true, what you believe based on your principles and your experience of life and truth. And four is rethink everything, which is change your perception of your life and your experience. So we're going to workshop now, and I'm going to ask these questions and just write the first thing that comes to your mind. Does everybody have paper and pen? If you're writing on your phone, do not text or check your text messages or emails. I will know the difference. Okay, how can you shake up the way you see things? When it comes to perception, consciousness is key. How do you perceive yourself? Let's start there. Are you carrying unnecessary baggage or telling a negative story about yourself? What beliefs do you have around yourself and relationships? Are they true or false? So you can pick the one question that really stands out to you the most, or you can write on all of them. And then I'd like you to share with your partner, or like a group of two or three. So I'll say them again. How can you shake up the way you see things? When it comes to perception, again, consciousness is key. How do you perceive yourself? Are you carrying unnecessary baggage or telling a negative story? What beliefs do you have around yourself or relationships? Are they true or false? So they can workshop it. And then, then hopefully a few of you, you will want to share with the rest of the group. Yes, one or two will share, the brave ones out there. How do you perceive yourself? <sighs> good. All good. <laughs> What's your, that's your credo? I'm trying to think what my, what my credo is. I'm talking about that today. Do you have an idea what my credo is? Yeah. Light of the creator. Whatever the creator wants. That's my credo. I think so. Okay. So we'd like to we'd like to ask raise your hand if you want to share any insight or understanding you came to. If nobody raises their hand, we just have to pick on But a few raise people. your hand even if you raise don't want to share but you have something to share. Because nobody ever really wants to share. But if you have something to say, 
that you think, if you say it, it's going to be a breakthrough for you, because by the way, that's how change starts. You force yourself into an uncomfortable situation, fully go all in and be committed, and then you're already halfway there, I promise you. You have nothing. I mean, people often say to me, you know, wow, you're so vulnerable. How do you share that? It's not even now. It's just like me telling you my darkest day is like telling you I have brown hair. It's just because when you do it, you're that, you're in it, and you flow from there, and change really happens in a really powerful way that's so supportive of where you want to be. So if you don't want to change, don't want to share, but you have something to share, please, yes. And tell us your name, too. And then I saw a hand over there, too, somewhere. I don't know. This, there. Hello, my Hi. name is Naike. And I actually... Uh, asked this question when I signed up for the class. And I understand that when you're in a relationship and the person in front of you, you have that pull and push. But when is it too much? Like when, if it's constant and you feel that the person in front of you is constantly trying to push you, constantly, um, you're never enough, never, when, <laughs> what is the limit of saying, okay, um, this is m more, not maybe a soulmate connection, because I'll use the term of uh, uh, Amanda Kabbalah in one class, and sometimes I feel that I'm living with the voice of Satan. <laughs> So I'm like, oh my God, okay. So how do I want to go to dinner with the voice of Satan? How do I want to, to, to constantly be in the same room? At, because it's like, I, I have to remind myself, okay, um, this is, okay, it's stop, pause, um, speak to the creator, ask him to help you transform this, but when is it too much? No, I don't know anything about you or your relationship. So without context into, you know, if we were one-on-one, -on -one, maybe I would give different information, but probably not. I think there's something called the Golem Effect and the Michelangelo Phenomenon. Have you heard of that? So the Golem Effect is when somebody's in a relationship and a person wants to create a version of them that they want. Right? They want them to be a certain way that appeases them, that appeals to their sensibility. They want you to be who they want you to be, not necessarily who you want to be. The Michelangelo phenomenon is exactly like that. Let's say there's a slab of clay, and you have somebody that helps mold the potential that exists within that clay. It has to be, though, united with what your own vision of yourself is. So in the relationship, the push-pull, and it's a great question, I'm happy you asked it, is that the things that you want to become, but it's hard for you. Let's say you want to be a motivational speaker, but you have a fear of public speaking, and your partner helps you and pushes you towards the goal and the vision you have for yourself, that's a healthy relationship. If your partner wants to create and mold you into something that you don't want to be, that's against who you want to become, but it would make them happy and comfortable, that is the goal and effect. So again, not knowing you personally, your partner, I think you have to discern between, is it their desire because it's going to make them happy and comfortable and what they want, or is it aligned with, although it's hard for you and your ego might say, no, I don't want to do this, but ultimately if you're having an honest conversation with yourself, it is who you want to become, it is what you want to do, that's how you can tell the difference. Yeah. And uh, some of you who maybe who listen to our podcast, you know that whenever Monica says something which I think is profound, I just repeat it. So I just want to underscore what Monica said because it's such an important, it's such an important point. Um, is that you know sometimes there's a misunderstanding of the idea of opposition, whereas, and this often happens in relationships where one partner wants the other partner to be one thing or the other. That's completely not what what Monica is speaking about. It's it's the sense that they are pushing. Each partner pushes the other to become the best version of themselves, not the version of themselves that the partner wants, which are com two completely different things. I think it's a very, very important, profound point. And again, and that has to be the question. If you're in a, even if you're in a happy relationship where you don't hear that scary voice, you know, the question has to be, is my partner pushing me to become the best version of myself that I want to become? Yeah, very and that important. really is the definition of 
ego-based love versus unconditional love. Unconditional love is that you love somebody, you love their essence, you love them just that they exist. Yeah, are there things that might not work or things that need to change or evolve? Yes, but you, you love them as they are. You accept them with their flaws and imperfections fully and then there's a change that happens together ego-based love is make me feel good feed me give me make me happy it's very different I saw a hand there before now wasn't that helpful for everybody yes. that's what sharing so is like so, me, so let's who, who else wants to participate hi hi <laughs> what's your name so how do you live without expectations when you have dreams for yourself, you know, ambitions and ideas and ideals? So, sorry, what's your name? Julia. Julia, thank you. So, and this is, you know, one of the, um, one of my favorite words, and my, our oldest daughter Miriam always points this out, one of my favorite words is paradox. And, and one of the ways to know that you're actually living a, a, I'll call it a spiritual life, but or the life that you're meant to be living, is that you live in a paradox. So I can tell you for myself, for example, of course, there are many things that I want to accomplish, right? I'll take a step back. So Monica and I were talking, as, as, we, as I asked Monica tonight, uh, earlier today, what are we going to talk about? And, and she mentioned this very important idea of every person really knowing their credo. I was thinking to myself, and Monica and I were workshopping, while everybody else was hopefully workshopping, what my credo is. And what's the truth? Wait, can anybody guess what that would be? That's a fun game. People who know, I don't, I don't even know me. No? Okay, well, I'll share with you. So, so my credo is whatever the creator wants, right? So what does that mean, right? On the, what, does that mean that you do nothing and sit there and wait? No. Paradox. On the one hand, you have a tremendous list of things you want to accomplish, tremendous amount of things you want to do. There's literally, because we also believe spiritually that there is no limitation into what we can accomplish, but while holding that thought, also completely open to none of that happening, or maybe even the complete opposite of all that happening. And that's, that's how you find truth in life. If, if there's something is true, it's going to have a paradox built in within it. And this idea of, of course, you're driven and you have a desire and you have a list and you have a what you want to accomplish. At the, at the same time, paradoxically, you're also completely open to what the light of the creator of the universe, whatever phrase you want to use, will lead you in direction that it will lead you. And what you will find is that eventually those two dovetail. Those two opposite realities dovetail. What you desire and plan with the creator coming in, the, the universe coming in, and pushing you in one direction or the other, your ultimate desire becomes even better than what you originally thought it was going to be. And I often say that w one of the greatest blessings in life is that what we want to happen usually doesn't happen which is great, right? Because we, we always see to a certain level, it's relatively limited. But if you really want to accomplish what your soul came into this world to accomplish, it's going to have to be within that paradox of, yes, I, dr I have a drive and desire and lists, but I'm completely open to anything, absolutely anything happening. And together, that's what creates the life that we're meant to be living. I would just add that the process is the purpose. And often we take our desires as absolute. This is what I need. This is what I want. This is where I should be by this age, by this stage. We have all these kinds of parameters around that. When really, you have to check where your desire is coming from. Is it coming from ego? Is it coming from a bad breakup? Is it coming from a loss? Where is the desire coming from? What is the motivator for that desire, right? So first, you have to look at that. Most of us don't do that. When you're starting to look at life, in that way and you start to go forward and move forward it's just our job is just to go where it's warmer right and then when we start to go and we have these honest, honest conversations with ourselves we want to invite the creator in and so okay i want this but whatever is for my greatest good is what i want because we don't have that clarity often we're not thinking in those ways we're thinking about i want this right now based on my limited view of what i see but we don't think what we see is limited we think what we see is everything so you know, that's why I always go back to the relationship with self. You need to have honest conversations with yourself. Most people lie to themselves many, 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 many times in one day <laughs> and throughout a lifetime. I think the first thing, and I, I haven't read this anywhere, I would say the first step in becoming a spiritual person is stop lying to yourself. 
And then from there, everything can open up and blossom. Then you see all paths, right? Because when we're lying to ourselves, this is the only way has to happen now the way I see it and that I desire it. We never look to say, okay, what's behind me? What's in front of me? Why do I have this desire? Where is it coming from? So if we could just pause and, and reframe, rethink that, then you will always have the clarity. You can call it intuition. You can call it a connection to something greater. You can call it light, but that we're, we're clouding that, that, that funnel, right? That doesn't allow us to see in each and every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Milita. Um, okay, one of the questions was uh, carrying unnecessary baggage. And like when you've gone through several relationships and, you know, um, you kind of have this just weight, the baggage of that, um, and you, you realize like it all happened for the best, like there was a good reason for it and you've kind of grown, like you understand that part, how do you emotionally like not contract when <laughs> that comes up? Like how do you get out of that, like I guess physical feeling of just feeling like you can't open up, I guess, <clears throat> even though you understand and you're like logically you get it, spiritually like maybe you get it, but physically you're just contracted. So it sounds like you're having a problem between your heart and your head. Your heart, your head knows, like, I've learned, this is for the good, on to the next, I have information now I didn't have before, but the heart is, I don't want to feel that again, I don't want to get hurt. The only way through that to the other side is when you, because the issue is not that you're afraid to give your heart to somebody again, it's that you don't trust yourself to choose the right partner because you have maybe, maybe, we all make mistakes, or you look back and you're like, oh, how did I, how did I think that was the person? And then now you, you are having a problem trusting yourself. So if you really have learned something, then now you're a different person. So you and the you that you are now can make different choices for yourself. So I think it's really more about how can I trust that I'll be able to pick the one. So going into the next relationship, make sure that all the things that you thought were important all the reasons you chose the partners you had you're leading with something else now like go back to that right i think often people on their first dates you know or second dates or third dates they come to me they're like you know i don't know if they liked me and i don't know this and they and that i said wait a second you're not on a job interview here i don't care what they felt how did you feel are they worthy of your connection are they worthy of hearing your personal things like you are they a friend to you? You know, and I often say, imagine the worst day of your life. How would that person sitting in front of you, how do you think they'd show up for you? And if you don't know that, then find that out. But this is not about them liking you. This is not about avoiding rejection. This is about you looking at somebody and saying, okay, do I want to let them in? Can they handle me with love and nurturing and care and compassion? Thank you. So we'll share one more point and then we'll have I think a little time for maybe a question or two so guess what the number one relationship killer is oh, what communication. lack of communication you've been who else he got it right by the way that is it is lack of communication because we even if we pride ourselves on being good communicators when we are fighting our ego doesn't want to be wrong. Our ego wants to see that our partner is all of the reasons for any perceived shortcomings that exist. It's, it's their fault. Ego never wants to ever say, I'm sorry. So, and there's a lot again in, in the master class. You can go to spirituallyhungry.life um, to check it out. But there's a lot of tools on how to find a fighting style that works. It's super important. There's so many tools around communicating. But the one thing that I really want to hone in on is that when your partner says something that hurts you, that makes you feel bad, I want you to look for the want behind their words. Because every time somebody lashes out at you, every time they say something that's hurtful, pause and say, okay, what is it that they really want? Because most people speak from hurt. They're not speaking from truth either. So if you can pause and really look at that, it's going to be a game changer. Everybody has 
a desire to be heard and seen. And we often can't ask for it. There's a lot of shame and wanting and expressing. So that's the first thing. Anytime, even if it's not a romantic relationship, you feel hurt in an exchange with a friend or a child or a parent. What is the want behind their words? And I guarantee you it's going to be a game changer. There's two other points that follow that, but I'm not going to unpack them now. But I'll just say one is never go below the belt, meaning... You know, we were at dinner years ago with a couple and she said, you're acting like your mother right now. And I hate your mother. And he's like, oh my God, this is not going well. They've been married for a very long time. It was like, we just got to know them. Our first dinner together. Um, or, you know, cursing them or wishing that they never were born or, you know, all those things that do actually happen. Never go below the belt because once things are said, they can never be taken back in that way. And the third is to be emotionally intelligent, to really know your partner so you know what their triggers are. When we were first married, I remember we got in a fight early on and Mikhail said, you know, that's just crazy to whatever I said, that's crazy. And I freaked out to like epic proportions. It was so not appropriate to whatever the fight was about. And he couldn't understand it. And by the way, I couldn't understand it. So I reflected and I said, that word crazy scares me because when I was seven, my uncle became schizophrenic and it seemed like it was overnight and I thought it was contagious and I thought I could catch it. So when he said crazy, I was like, You're, you called me crazy? He didn't call me crazy. I heard he called me crazy and crazy was a word I never wanted to hear in relation to me, right? So when I shared that with him, that's emotional intelligence. Now he had a part of my story and my past and my history, and he never ever used that word in relation to me ever again. I mean, now it wouldn't matter because now I know it's not contagious and I've gotten through the fear of it, but that's what emotional intelligence is. It's knowing your partner's story before you came into it. So again, a lot to unpack there, but I think those are just little things to I'll think just, about. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to share just to underscore again something Monica just said which I think is one of Monica's, amongst her great gifts, is, is the, the want behind the words. I've heard Monica many times uh, with couples where they're having a, an argument, disagreement, and they each think that it's about what they're talking about, but it, it's never about what they're talking about. And this is, again, fundamentally almost always true. Whenever there's an argument or disagreement, especially big ones, it's never about the actual topic or issue that's being discussed. There's something much deeper behind it. And unless you're able to get to the want behind the words, you're never going to be able not only to get over whatever disagreement, but you'll never be able to actually create the emotional intelligence and that strong foundation in the relationship. And I have to say that I've been really dumbfounded at times where you have a couple that's arguing about the kids, you know, and when they go to sleep. And then at the end of the, at the end of the conversation, Monica made them realize that their argument was completely about something completely different. It wasn't about the bedtime of the kids or anything else that we usually argue about. And if you think about that, whether you're in a relationship or you're you're looking to be in a relationship, that piece of information, right? That that whenever there's an argument, disagreement, when somebody's hurt, it's almost never about the actual words or situation. There's always something deeper behind it. And if you're able to get to that, then not only are you able to traverse this current situation, you're actually able to make the relationship that much stronger and better. Well, which... I remember that because I was, I was talking to a couple and they were fighting and like, I just don't know what you want. And I'm like, really, how do you not know? I, I said, I know what you both want. I've been working <laughs> with you for 10 years. This is what you want. This is what you want. The fact that you don't know what the other one wants is because you don't want to know. You're not paying attention and your ego right now wants to be heard. Like, how is it that I have the information and I'm not in the relationship, right? So it's right there in front of us if we're willing to see it. Yeah, and I just, uh, I think to, to my final point on this is something that I share, uh, as Monica mentioned, we have the opportunity to, to uh, officiate at many, many weddings. Uh, and one of the, my favorite word in the wisdom of Kabbalah is the word ensof, which literally translated means the endless. And relationships are meant to be the epitome of the revelation of the light of the creator in this world. And if that is so, what that means is that every relationship that we have, especially the one with our partner, is meant to be one that is constantly getting stronger and better. You know, we know, I was re you know, I've often mentioned this, but Daniel Kahneman, those of you who know, there's a book called, he wrote, he was a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist. Uh, he actually just passed away a few months ago. 
And he wrote a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's really an amazing book. If you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. And what he writes there is that, is that getting married is the most illogical decision that people ever make. Because we know the statistics. Relationships don't end well. Marriages usually do not end well. Still, humanity, everybody in this room, is either in a relationship or desiring to be in a relationship and eventually probably married. Why? Well, the answer is because we all know within our soul that the, the greatest revelation of light, goodness, blessings, is from our relationships. But it has to also know that our relationship is meant to be better, more fulfilling in year one, year five, year ten, than the first year. Year twenty, than in the first ten. And only, and this is just a, a quick plug to Rethink Life, uh, Rethink Love, uh, re spiritually hungry that life to watch rethink love because unless unless you're doing this work we fall into the statistics but if you do the work and this is why it's so important then you will experience that in year 26 of a marriage you're actually more in love and more fulfilled from the relationship than you were in year one through 25 and you have to know that that's possible but it's not possible unless we're constantly and consistently doing the work both individually and, and, and together. So maybe we have, we have time for maybe one or two other questions. Those were really great questions before. Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I was very impressed, by the way, that you knew the page number. That was very I impressive. I too. Yeah, but still. <laughs> so. Yeah, my question was, I thought about it earlier. So on, on a level of like, maintain a relationship, right? We have busy lives, and then in Kabbalah, we do so many things, right? Ritualistically or spiritually and everything that we do connection-wise. A, how do you find time to have fun? And B, on that level, how much, on the hierarchy of things, how important is having fun as a couple? Very, very Monica important. has a whole chapter on this. But what I'd say is that's probably, I would say it's probably the number one key, right? I'd say it's what makes it all worthwhile. I think number one is appreciation. I think number two is laughter and levity and fun. So relationships are work, as we said. It's a lot of effort. If it's not fun, it's really not worthwhile because the other parts are challenging. And it's not that you find time, you have to make time. And I can tell you, if you cut out all the times that you have a negative thought about yourself or you indulge in things that you know aren't good for you or I'm not saying you but like gossip or whatever all those things that we spend time doing we cut that out of our day you're gonna gain about three hours a day no I'm serious I've done this three hours a day to now invest time and energy into what really is important you have to decide is a relationship something that you <laughs> believe is important enough right because it's not Again, people put a lot of effort and time into finding the one and become, you know, like I'm, that, and then they find the one and it's like, okay, that check, now it's on to the next thing. No, that's just the beginning. So I can't emphasize enough how important that is to make it a priority uh, because that's real connection that happens there. I would, I would only add is that, is that in order to really have life that is filled as much as possible with, with fun and levity, you have to not take yourself too seriously. Like, I, I personally don't take myself too seriously. Thankfully, in our relationship, Monica doesn't take herself too seriously. And that allows for a lot of fun and a laughter. Lot. We laugh a lot. Yeah. yeah. Maybe one more question that there's... Yeah, right here. Hi. You said we need to be honest to ourselves. How could I make sure that I'm honest to myself? It's a good question. I think that it's about... Um, checking in with yourself throughout the day. I really believe in journaling and writing things out. So if you write down your thoughts in the day or the different things, let's say you wanted to do, you have your goals and then you have your thoughts and you go back and you look at it at the end of the day, you're going to be identifying, be able to identify what is true and what is not. But you have to be willing to hear the answer. I think most people lie to themselves because they don't want to hear the answer because then they actually have to affect and create a change in their lives that they might not be ready to do. So even if you do nothing with the information, just start to check with yourself. This feeling I have, this belief I have, this thing I said to myself or thought about myself, is it true or is it not throughout the day, especially the feelings that make you not feel great about yourself or the people in your life. Look at them, analyze them, and then if they're not true, 
choose the more positive thought. It's just a, it's a, it's emotional feedback that you give to yourself each and every day, throughout the day. Well, thanks, well, y'all. Thank you all for joining us. As a reminder, <laughs> make sure you go to spirituallyhungry.life and watch Monica's masterclass. And I bless all of us to have all of our relationships become that much better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.